Classroom Under the Sea is made possible through the generous support of Diversity and Aquatic Project's official sponsor. To learn more, please visit diversityinaquatics.com. Classroom Under the Sea is presented by the Marine Resources Development Foundation on Key Largo in the Florida Keys and Roan State Community College, one of Tennessee's community colleges. Hi, lad. How are you? Good. How's it going? Welcome back to Duels. Hey, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Lad will join us for Classroom Under the Sea right after this. Welcome to Classroom Under the Sea. I'm Jessica Fain with Rhone State Community College, and we're here broadcasting live from Jules Undersea Habitat. We are broadcasting live, so if you hear some background noise, um, that's just our live support systems, and we, so we are sorry if there's any kind of interference with the microphones. Um, if you are wanting to ask any kind of questions for today's lecture, you can contact us through Facebook page at Classroom Under the Sea, or you can contact us on Twitter using hashtag Classroom Under the Sea. So, today we're going to talk about predators and prey, and specifically we're going to focus on the lionfish and the sharks. We have a special guest here with us. We've got Lad Akins, and Lad um, is the director of the special, special projects for the Reef Environmental Education Foundation. So, Lad, how is it going? It's good. Thanks for having me today. Thanks for being here. All right, Lad, do you want to tell us a little bit about the lionfish? Yeah, I'd like to. Um, first of all, before we get started, I did bring you and Bruce a little present. Okay. So for your reading pleasure, and then oh uh, boy, and, the, and, <laughs> the lionfish cookbook. Yeah. So and, and we'll see what we can do about getting you guys some uh, some fish down here to eat as well. Okay, good. That's I'd, not gonna happen I'd like to try it. <laughs> I'd like to try it for yeah. sure. Well, um. Yeah, I did bring a PowerPoint presentation, okay. so we can put that up and we can use that as a little bit of a guide. Okay. Talk about the background of this invasion, the biology, ecology of lionfish, which are an invasive species, and then a little bit about what's being done to control this this problem. Alrighty. So we can we can stop along the way if if we have questions and maybe make this a little bit interactive. Okay. All right, great. Well, first of all. As you mentioned, um, I'm the director of special projects for REEF. And uh, just a, a short blurb about who we are. People can find out more by going to reef.org. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're a marine conservation organization. We're based here in the Florida Keys, but we do work all over the world. Um, we have uh, programs that involve divers collecting information about what they see underwater. Kind of like what Audubon does for birds, we do for fish. Okay. So fish survey project, but we also have a lot of special projects addressing artificial reefs, addressing uh, grouper spawning aggregations, and then my main focus is working on exotic or invasive species, things that are in areas that they don't belong. And of course that is why we're talking about lionfish. Right. So um, if you want to go to the next slide. We're sitting here with Dr. South Jose Florida, Castro, this area that we who are is a in noted right now, shark. Is a hot spot for non-native species. Uh, more than 30 different non-native species have been found in these waters. Um, and these are things that, are, that belong in other oceans. But off our coastal waters, we see a lot of this happen. Um, those fish have been documented in a publication by the USGS. And uh, for most of these fish, the sightings were just a single or few. They didn't last over time. The fish just weren't able to survive. But for one, we go to the next slide, you'll see a beautiful picture of lionfish. This is the first time we've ever had a non-native marine fish anywhere in the uh -huh. Atlantic become established. And that means when we say established, that means it's reproducing, it's increasing in abundance, and it's increasing in its distribution as well. So these fish have actually gained a foothold and are most likely here to stay. And they're, and they're doing some major damage they to the They are doing a lot of bad things, okay. and we're going to talk about some of those things. Okay. Um, to give you an idea of how this invasion has progressed, we have this very great map that shows lionfish first showing up off South Florida as far back as 1985. And then a few isolated sightings until about 2000, 
And then in about 2007, just an explosion of this population throughout the entire range from North Carolina to South America. And when I say explosion, what I'm really talking about is de really high densities of lionfish. If we go to the next slide, like this. I mean, wow. lionfish are becoming one of the most abundant fish on some sites. Now, I, I know from my personal experience and Bruce's, when we dive, we see a lot of lionfish. Not quite as much as what's on the screen here, but um, you know, to see one or two is, is a normal occurrence at every dive. Yeah, there are many places now where lionfish are very, very common to see in the water. And there are some places, particularly where divers aren't going very often, where you see densities like this. You just see huge numbers of lionfish on some of these sites. If we look at a, at a depiction of that and how that compares to lionfish in their native territory, you see that studies from the native range, like the Marquesas and the Red Sea, show lionfish in much lower densities than what we saw in the Bahamas only four years after lionfish showed up. And now we would probably have to have to raise the screen and oh no. and uh, <laughs> and you know follow that abundance and, and the densities are still increasing. So certainly lots of lionfish out in the waters. The habitats that we find lionfish in vary from shoreline areas where we have mangroves or man-made canals or boat basins to patch reefs to the offshore ledges, even artificial reef structures. And the deepest lionfish records come from submarine observations, a thousand feet deep. Wow. So if you could imagine the map we were looking at earlier from North Carolina to South America, from the shoreline to a thousand feet deep in all of these habitat types, that's the kind of distribution we're seeing. That's a major distribution yeah. then. Yeah, that's a huge area. And this is in a marine environment. Right. We also have a lot of estuaries, especially in, in Florida and around the Gulf, and lionfish are starting to show up in estuary areas as well. They've been documented more than four miles inland from the mouth of an estuary in very low salinities. Wow. So we're not talking about a freshwater fish that's right. going to invade lakes and streams, but they are able to move quite a distance up into these estuaries, which are very important nursery areas, and uh, important to the ecology of our ocean systems. Right, because a lot of the reef fish actually use those areas, like you said, for a nursery. And so if the lionfish are in there, they, can, they have the potential to wipe out the, the, the babies, the new generations of reef fish. Exactly. The oceans are very connected to estuaries. So what goes on in the estuaries uh, has an effect of what's happening out on the, out on the reef areas that we enjoy. So some of the fish we've collected have been very, very small. We can find juveniles like this that look just like the adult, but some are quite large. And the interesting thing is that when we look at what's known about lionfish in their native territory, they reach a size of about a foot. And here we're seeing lionfish almost a half a meter in size. And we even have some unofficial reports of lionfish larger than half a meter, 52 centimeters. Wow, that's that's kind of scary. Not gonna lie. <laughs> yes, that, that is a very large fish, and and uh, so it, it's interesting that they are getting so much larger here than they do in their native territory. Probably because they've been released from the controlling factors that we see. The scary thing, though, is not just that we have lionfish and we have high abundances, but the worrisome thing is what they're doing to our native marine ecosystem. Lionfish are a stalking predator. So they track their prey, they follow it by sight, just like a lion would on the African safari. And when they get close enough, stalking their prey, they make a rapid rush forward and they swallow their prey whole. And basically anything that moves, that fits in their mouth, is fair game for lionfish. Okay. So they can get close enough to it and it's gonna fit in that big mouth, they'll eat it. Some of the things that we have found in lionfish stomachs include commercially important species, things we rely on for food fish or, or for economies like grouper and snapper. When they're juveniles, they fit very well into those lionfish mouths, so they're prey. We also have recreationally important things, things that we like to enjoy when we're diving and snorkeling, all the beautiful ornamental reef fish. Right. And maybe most importantly are the ecologically important species, like parrotfish. Mm -hmm. Parrotfish are grazers and they eat algae and they help keep that algae growth in check so it doesn't overgrow coral. 
Well, lionfish love parrotfish. And by eating those ecologically important species, they may have what we call a trophic cascade effect, which means they'll consume those key species, which will have an effect on other parts of the system in ways that we may not even be able to draw a direct linkage to. And those are our biggest concerns, really, is that you know, with such a broad diet, these lionfish could have major impacts. Well, and, and like you said, if, if they wipe out the parrotfish or they reduce the number of parrotfish, then the algae can grow out of control. It can compete with the coral and smother the coral out. And then once that coral goes, that's the home of a lot of, for a lot of other fish. And that's, a, that's their um, food source as well. So Certainly. So, yeah. Certainly. Homes for them. And then also things like um, protection right. of, of shorelines against storm damage. You know, those coral reefs serve a very important function to help break down wave action. So that those, those kinds of effects are things that we can't predict very well, but certainly could happen. So if we think about what lionfish are are doing, what kinds of things they're eating, that gives us an indication of where those impacts may be. But the magnitude of the impact is also pretty scary. Lionfish are gluttonous feeders, and just this single image that we're looking at, one lionfish, 64 prey fish, wow. that that single lionfish had consumed pretty much all at the same time, if you look at the digestion level. So they have the ability to really impact the native system, not just by what they're eating, but how much they're consuming. And when, when we put that into a scientific context, if we look at the next slide, you'll see work that was done by Dr. Stephanie Green at Oregon State University. And this work in the Bahamas showed lionfish reducing the native fish population, the native prey fish, by an average of 65% in just two years with some sites being reduced as much as 95 percent. Wow. That's that's a, yeah, that's a steep decrease. That's a classroom of 100 students, and you come back two years later, and there's five left. Right. And um, that is the kind of predation that our oceans just can't withstand. Well, not only, I mean, it's, it's bad for the ecosystems, but it's also bad for tourism as well. I mean, if we think about this as, you know, we've got a pristine reef, and where we had lots of of biodiversity and lots of really pretty fish and then the lionfish come in mm -hmm. and devastate those fish populations I'm not gonna pay money to go out on a dive there I mean that's not where I want to go I sure. want to go see all the nice pretty fish yep, exactly just a couple of slides to talk about why lionfish may be so successful and um, one of the one of the facilitating factors is their reproduction Lionfish are pair spawners, so a single male and a single female get together to reproduce and they re release a mass of eggs. And these masses of eggs contain about 30,000 uh, eggs per spawning event. And they can spawn as frequently as every four days. Wow. So we'll let somebody else do the math, but it's, <laughs> we're talking millions of eggs being, being produced every year by these lionfish. So reproduction is one factor. Another factor that helps them is that they have these venomous defenses that um, help protect them against being eaten by other species. So very long, very sharp spines, and uh, this is a good image that shows those long dorsal spines that stick up, and they, they contain a venom, and that's great protection. So they're reproducing a lot, and they're being pretty well protected through their venomous defenses. So that's probably why they are being so successful, amongst other things as well. But those are two big reasons. It's pretty bad news so far, huh? Yeah. Yeah, it's not looking good. <laughs> no, it's not. But we're not gloom and doom. And, and we do have some snippets of good news. The most important is that we're finding local control can be very effective at keeping lionfish populations down, at least in the areas we're able to get to. So that's good news. Right. And really that's what's driving most efforts right now is this idea of local control, being able to reduce the populations of lionfish and allow native species to recover. Lionfish are incidentally captured through hook and line fishing, so mm -hmm. people can catch them on hook and line, but they're not able to directly target lionfish. Right. It's incidental, you know, whatever bites your hook. Right. They're also captured in the trap fishery. So lobster traps and fish pots in the region, a lionfish go into those traps for shelter. 
So when the traps are pulled up, they may have line fish in them. But again, it's not a targeted fishery. Right. Really, when we talk about targeted removals, we're talking about divers and snorkelers going out hunting for lionfish and then using either spears or nets to collect the fish to, to take them out of the water. So a lot of people are getting engaged. They're very interested in helping protect their marine ecosystems. So they, their workshops, their events, their classes being held and taught all over the region to show people how to, how to go out and and uh, target lionfish. There's also been uh, publications talking about best strategies, how you actually deal with an invasion. And uh, there are countries working throughout the entire region to develop lionfish strategies, both in their own countries and on a regional and national scale. So a lot of work is going in to, to addressing this invasion. Let's go to the next slide. So. When we talk about controlling the invasion, because lionfish are so widespread, eradication is really off the plate. They're just too right. far. You know, North Carolina to South America, all of the Gulf of Mexico, we just, too deep. Yeah, we just can't do it. That's it, right. There's no way. But we do know that we can suppress the population. We can reduce it. And the main goal when we talk about control is making the most effective use of our limited resources. There are only so many people and so much money, excuse me, to be able to go out and, and target lionfish. And prioritizing and planning where we're going to do our removals. Are we going to go to marine protected areas or spawning grounds or nursery areas and identifying where we need to put most of our effort. And there's some, some work being done now again by Dr. Stephanie Green, looking at how many lionfish we need to remove in order to have the ecosystem recover. So right. if we can't remove all of them, how many do we need to remove? Right, because our ecosystems can handle a few, just not in the numbers that we currently have, correct? Exactly, okay. exactly. And determining what that tipping point is, how many can they handle is, is the key element. And so really that's where a lot, of the, a lot of the research is going right now, looking at how many we, we need to remove and how much effort that's going to take, man hours, et cetera. Right. So um, a few things that, that play into the model that has been developed include determining um, the biomass of fish on an area, the prey fish that lionfish have available to eat, looking at the predation rates of lionfish on those areas, and the densities and sizes of lionfish. And when we grab all that information, we can actually plug it into a model that gives us an idea of where that tipping point is. So if we look at this graph, we'll see that um, we have a theoretical tipping point, which is the number of lionfish a reef can sustain without declining. Right. And you see density of lionfish across the bottom. If we remove lionfish, below that tipping point, we should have prey communities that stay high. However, if we don't remove enough lionfish, we should see a decline in the prey communities, which is what we don't want. So we're testing this model right now to see how accurate it is and how well we can, we can predict that tipping point. And then, of course, after we're able to predict the tipping point, we need to figure out what the cost is going to be man hours, how often we need to remove lionfish, et cetera. And that's really where the, where the diver and snorkeler communities come into play. They're the ones that are out there in the water doing the removals. Right. And uh, there are a lot of different ways that removals are happening and, and control is taking place. One of the most interesting of these lionfish tournaments or lionfish derbies, it's like a fishing tournament, but you're going after lionfish. And, and instead of using a hook and line, divers are going in with nets or spears and seeing how many lionfish they can get in a single day. So there are a whole series of these events that are held throughout the region uh, every year and they're bringing in thousands of lionfish. We're finding that these derbies can be much more effective than we thought, not just at raising awareness and taking lionfish out of the water, but covering a very broad area. So we've done some studies in the Bahamas before and after lionfish derbies and found that um, in areas where the derby didn't take place, the lionfish populations were pretty stable. But in the areas that the lionfish derbies did take place, 
there was a huge reduction in the biomass of lionfish due to a single day event. Wow. So, so things like derbies and adopter reef programs where divers are actively going out targeting lionfish are really proving to be effective. And these derbies are getting more and more interest every year, I, I believe, correct? Y yes, they are. And, and divers really want to help. They want to protect the marine resource. Good. And this is one of the ways they're able to do it. They're out there taking lionfish all the time as well. But the derby focus tends to get people going to areas they normally wouldn't go to. So they can find more lionfish, of course. So right. They have to get the big ones. They the, do. The <laughs> well, they're also awards for the smallest lionfish as oh, well. Oh, yeah? But, yeah. But, um, that's where the picture of the one on the fingernail came the from, fingernail, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> but then one other thing that's, that's gaining a lot of momentum, and maybe the only weakness that lionfish have, is that they're good eating and developing a market for lionfish can provide incentive for fishermen to go out and target lionfish to supply that market demand. So there's been a lot of work recently in promoting lionfish as a food fish, encouraging people to consume it, to order it in the restaurant. Even a non-diver can help out by... Right, by ordering lionfish. Sure, yeah. And I've heard that that's starting, that is starting to appear on some of the high-end restaurant menus and, and restaurants around like the Keys where there's lionfish Certainly, and, everywhere. And, and even beyond the Keys. So there are restaurants in New York and Charleston that are serving lionfish on a regular basis. And, and it's a very good eating fish. So I brought you the cookbook so you guys can... So next time when you come down, yeah. you're going to bring me the, the fillets right. and everything cooked? Well, <laughs> what we might be able to do is, I know you guys have had some, um, some restaurants fixing meals to send down. Maybe we can talk them into fixing a lionfish dinner for you guys. That'd be good. I'd, I'd like to try some lionfish. Great, great. Well, um, how about if we stop there and um, let's maybe we can talk a little bit more casually about this whole issue. Okay. Right? It's kind of the background of the invasion and to give people an idea of what's going on. And I saw you had some great lesson plans on the on the Rhone State website. So maybe the students right. can use some of that presentation to help help provide some info for the right. lessons. They get a chance to do some of the prey predator models. Uh, they play tag and so they get to learn how to, you know, if it's one person against the whole classroom, it's not exactly fair. That's um, right. And then they can play with you know how many predators versus how many preys, and it's it's something that's it's a realistic model. It's it's something very similar to what you use when you guys look at the lionfish and, like you said, the the biodiversity of the fish that are in the reef systems. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So I did bring a couple of other things. Um, yes. I brought a few examples of the, the lionfish spines. So this this is an don't poke yourself. I'm not gonna poke myself. But the I'll venom try. is gone. I'll try. But um, this is an example of one of the dorsal spines to give you an idea of how long and how sharp that, wow. that spine is. There have been a lot of people who thought that they may be able to um, encourage native predators mm -hmm. to consume lionfish by offering up speared lionfish to the predators right. and, and you're talking the training. The, right. Um, so when I talked to you in March, that's what we talked about was um, a lot of people try and feed the groupers and the eels. Those are the predators they're trying to introduce to the lionfish. Right. Okay. Yes, and groupers, eels, sharks, barracudas, any of those top predators. And um, you don't have to teach a shark to eat something, first of all. <laughs> Sharks will eat what's there to eat. But the problem that we're finding is that this idea of conditioning a predator to take a, a speared lionfish is creating an association of that free meal with the diver. Right. And it's actually creating unsafe conditions for people out there collecting lionfish. And, and there's no evidence that it actually works to get the predators to go out and start controlling lionfish on their own. There may be incidental predation, you know, here or there they may right. eat one or two. But if you had to eat something with a spine like this, you may not want to yeah, do it again. Yeah, even if I could handle the venom and the venom didn't bother me, um, I don't think I'd want to chew on that. No, no, <laughs> this is not an appetizing thing to eat. And it's evolved, lionfish have evolved these very long, sharp spines for a good reason, because they work. Right. They deter predators. So it's not likely that controlling predation is going to come from something eating these healthy, well-defended, venomous, spiny lionfish. Right. Maybe control in the form of competition, um, 
maybe control in the form of something eating the eggs or the larva, but probably not the taking full. these big spots. Right. All right. So when you go out to collect lionfish, you said you can you can use a spear gun, and that you're not actually touching the lionfish. But what about um, when you you said catch them in nets? How do you do that? How do you protect yourself from the lionfish? Yeah, that's a great question. We can use nets or spears, and there are tools that um, that allow us to do that. Uh, one of the most valuable pieces of equipment we use are puncture-resistant gloves like this. So there's a special material in the palm of this glove that prevents the spines from penetrating. So it gives us an added layer of protection to be able to handle the fish if we need to. Um, but the fish are quite bold. They let us get very close. Um, either spearing or netting can be very effective depending on the circumstances and the size of the fish. A and tools like this, special containers for the fish to go into are, are being developed and uh, really provide great ways for us to be safe in our collecting efforts. Okay. Well, Lad, you brought some other stuff, but we're going to have to wait on that. Um, we're going to go ahead and move to uh, Jose Castro. He was one of our other guests from earlier. He was able to come down to the habitat and hang out with me and answer a couple questions. Um, so Jose Castro is a fisheries biologist. He works with NOAA, and he used to work as a senior scientist at Moat Marine Laboratory. Um, he is also an author of the book, The Sharks of North America, and we had a chance to sit down with him earlier, and so take a look. We're sitting here with Dr. Jose Castro, who is a noted shark biologist and the author of The Sharks of North America. Dr. Castro, can you tell me a little bit about your work? Well, I have been doing research on sharks for the past two or three decades. I, uh, much of my work has been on reproduction in sharks, but I also was the uh, biologist working on the management plan for the sharks way back then in the 90s that started conservation of sharks in the, in, in the East Coast. And I still conduct a lot of research on, on sharks, usually free production, and I write about their history and about their, the knowledge of sharks and so forth. Okay. And do you want to show us your presentation? Yes, I'd be glad to. If slides. we can have the first slide. Well, shark fishes are divided basically in two groups. You have the bony fishes that have skeletons made out of bone, and you have the cartilaginous fishes that whose skeleton is made out of cartilage, like the stuff that makes up your nose and ears and so forth. It's a lot softer, it's, you know, it's structurally different from bone. Right. The, the uh, bony fishes, I mean, the, the cartilaginous fishes, there are three general groups. One is the rabbit fishes or chimeras, that you can see on the screen, is the one on the top. This is a very small group, maybe 50 species of very deep water uh, uh, animals. The second one is the sharks that we know, uh, you know, there's probably about 500 species. And then the next one is the, the rays, which are basically, I say they are flattened sharks, you know. All, all these three are the cartilaginous fishes. Mm -hmm. uh, and the sharks, it, it's a very diverse group of animals that uh, are, they have generally cylindrical bodies, pectoral fins separated from the head. They, the way they breathe is different from the rays. And what we're going to see in this lecture is that there's a tremendous diversity in the sharks. The other group is the rays, which are, as I said, flattened sharks. You know, the, at the bottom you have a sawfish, uh, at the top you have a guitar fish, and different types of rays, uh, eagle rays and sting rays and so forth. This is probably the most diverse and advanced group of the elasmobranchs. So the, the elasmobranchs being the, the, the animals with gills uh, like the shark. Uh, these animals range from the whale shark, which is the largest fish in the ocean, to, uh, to the basking shark, which is the second largest fish in, in, in the world, to some very small animals, such as the uh, cigar sharks that are full grown at only a few inches. Well, he's tiny. <laughs> yes, they are very small uh, and lives in deep water, too. Uh, when we look at the origin of this group, the, one of the interesting things is that way back then in Paleozoic times, the sharks, the line of animals that gave rise to the sharks separated from the rest of the vertebrates. You know, one line gave rise to the bony fishes, the, the amphibians, the reptiles, the mammals, etc. But the chondrichthys or the cartilaginous fishes went on their own and have been evolving separately 
from the fresno divertebrate so all their adaptations are different because they split off from the vertebrate line a very long time ago if we look at it in perspective and i don't know if you can read that line but this is just showing you the the up east the the sharks are there in the blue i think i can see from here yeah the yes you can see that these animals have a tremendously long evolutionary history. The f sharks appear as fossils in the rocks from the Devonian period some 450 million years ago. Wow. And if we uh, compare it to the evolution of humans, we see that we can probably push the evolution of humans about four and a half million years. So the evolution of sharks goes back 450 million years. We, there we have a, a picture of uh, Klaus Alesi, a shark from the Devonian period, 450 million years ago. So what I'm saying is sharks have evolved for a period of time a hundred times longer than human evolution. So you can imagine what modern nature can do in that incredibly long period of time. Yes, that's amazing. Now, we don't really know even though we have fairly good fossils of the earliest, uh, some of the earliest sharks, we don't have a complete fossil record for the sharks for several reasons. The, when a bony fish dies, unless it's been eaten by somebody else, and the carcass uh, is preserved, you know, the flesh washes off or rots off, right. that skeleton remains together. And if it's buried, like this fish on the beach was being buried, you know, if it's buried in the sand for millions of years, the skeleton will fossilize and you can, and a, a paleontologist or an ichthyologist can come back millions of years later, uh, unearth that skeleton, and they can see more or less what the fish look like. Not so with sharks. Sharks have a skeleton, just like, uh, like uh, the other vertebrates do, but it's made out of cartilage and cartilage sharks after they die is the, the vertebrae and the teeth. And those don't tell us what the shark look like. For example, in Carcharodon megalodon, which is one of the extinct sharks from the Miocene, we know they were very large, but we don't know what family it belonged to or anything. All we got is those teeth, and they don't tell us what the animal look like. Now, so when we try to figure out how did the sharks evolve? We don't have a fossil record that we can look at the different stages. So we are forced to infer things from looking at actual sharks. We have to look at them and see what is it that made this animal so successful. And we can go and look at different aspects. You know, you gotta look at me. Uh, the, the, if we look at, for example, thresher sharks, and we're going to look at the eye of those animals. If we, if we make a cross section through the eye and you can see a, an eye, a thresher shark eye that has been cut in half, you can see the lens in the center and around you see that shiny layer, that's called a taperum lucidum. Right. It's a reflecting layer that behind the retina, so the light goes through it, bounces off the taperum and very stimulate this retina, so it makes it a very efficient eye. And the, the shark eye is a fairly sophisticated eye. And next slide. Uh, this is a, a, a shot of the thresher shark. And right behind the eye is that, that uh, pink organ back there. That's a, a heat exchanger designed to keep the eye warm at great depth. So it's very, the, the eye pigments will be very effective and so forth. So the, the shark eye is one of those great uh, things that uh, sharks have evolved to make them successful. Another one is their entire sensory apparatus. The, uh, you know, they have a lateral line that allows, us, allows them to sense vibration in the water. If we look at the underside of a shark, we see that it's, it's covered in tiny little uh, pores. Those are the Amphilius lorenzini, which are electroreceptors. And we can have, there's a diagram in red showing the Amphili. Uh, these are electro electric senses and it's something that we humans have not evolved because we haven't had a need for it and our evolution has been so short compared to sharks and but sharks can with the, the Amphilius lorenzini they can detect prey in the absence of light or of factories uh, 
stimulation or auditory stimulation. They can sense, like for example, a ray that is buried in the sand. Right. They can sense the electric field that surrounds a living organism and they can prey on it by locating it under the sand. Uh, next slide. Um, another thing that is very interesting is the shark skin. And I'm not just talking about the camouflage because you know they're very well camouflaged. If you look at a mako shark, if you have ever dived in the deep indigo uh, uh, waters of the Gulf Stream, and you look at the, the coloration, dorsal coloration of a shark that is cruising down there, you know that it's basically invisible. Right. Uh, the treasure sharks, for example, they reflect light, the light that is in their environment, and they have become basically invisible when they're underwater. If you look at it, if you get lucky to see a thresher on the water, it's very difficult, especially when it's heading towards you. It's practically invisible. If we look at the skin, they have what they call placoid scales, you know, which are like they also call dermal denticles. If we put it an electro if we put it under an electron microscope, we see that they're actually very complex, it can be very complex. And it appears that these uh, these scales are also covering a, in a mucus layer give laminar flow to the shark so that they can glide through the water without making any noise or any disturbance that can alert their prey and the scales are also diagnostic you can look at the different scales of different sharks and they're, they're actually not only beautiful but very complex you isn't can this isn't the derm dermal denticles what makes the skin really tough too? Yes, because if you see those points, you know, you can, you see that if you s slide your hand from the head to the tail on a shark, it's very smooth. But right. if you try to go the other way, it's very sharp because all of those points grab against your skin. In fact, in the old days, shark skin used to be used as a sandpaper. Before they developed sandpaper, okay. they had shark skin that they used just to as, uh, to f uh, smooth out surfaces uh, like wood or, or metal or whatever. Um, and also at one time the sword, the hilt of German swords and other instruments were made in, were coated with uh, shark skin. That way if you were in a battle with you had blood in your hands and all of that, your sword you would not, uh, you could still hold it. Next, uh, uh, some of them are very complex and we can only guess at their uh, meaning. That's from a, a cigar shark on, in there. And here we have a horn shark and a, a sand tiger shark. So they're very complex and you can tell the type of shark it is coming from depending on you know the structure. It tells you whether it's a very fast moving shark or a slow moving shark and so forth. So it's a very interesting thing. So the next item that we can look at the biology of sharks with that I think made them successful was the evolution of the shark jaw, which is an incredible, one of the most incredible cutting instruments in the animal kingdom. They, are cre incre they have, uh, they can exer exercise tremendous pressure, you know, so to cut something. Not only that, they have replaceable teeth, so they always have a sharp edge. Right. It's not like uh, in the uh, mammals, for example, you know, where once a tiger, for example, loses his uh, fangs and so forth, it can no longer catch its normal prey. But once an elephant goes through a six set of uh, teeth, it can no longer chew its uh, food. In sharks, you, they are constantly moving those, replacing those teeth. So they always have a sharp edge, which helps in different ways. You know, they can cut it, 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 it slides out of something and it's not hanging by a thread on it, you know, they can, Right. You know, by, with their sawing motion that they use, they have a very effective uh, cutting thing. And it's, it's the difference between sharks and bony fish. The bony fish usually has to swallow something whole. Right. That it's got to be smaller than its mouth or else it can choke on it. But a shark can cut it into different pieces and swallow it. Uh, we can look at the dentition. The tiger shark, for example, those teeth are like chisels, you know. They are very stout, very strong, and it allows them, they have the same type of teeth in both jaws, which allows them to, to cut turtles, large loggerhead or hawkbill turtles, they can cut them in half. I mean, oh, which wow. would be a very difficult thing to yes. do, but yet a big tiger shark can come over and take that turtle and cut it into small pieces it can swallow. In fact, in one case I saw 
six different large loggerhead turtles inside the stomach of a, a, a 12, 14 foot uh, tiger shark that had just eaten them in smaller pieces. Others such as the sand tigers, they have needle-like teeth for grasping fish. Uh, and the white shark, for example, has very large teeth with separated edges for cutting, you know, taking fairly soft skin uh, prey such as sea lions, soft skin compared to other animals. Right. And they can cut it, take a sea lion and cut it into smaller pieces. Um, and this is the uh, shark of uh, Jaws fame. You can see the, the size of some of those jaws there in the picture on the right. And here's a slide of, you know, an old slide of a, a diver that happened to be on his surfboard when a white shark came over and bit through him and the, uh, the surfboard as well. And as, uh, as a few of us predicted, you know, when, when the, the surfboard washed ashore, that the diver would be found too, because normally white sharks don't like to eat people. Right. You know, they're looking for sea lions. Uh, we probably don't taste uh, well enough for, for them to like it. We don't have enough energy. Right. And, and us like a sea lion does with all that fat and so forth. But the, the fact is that a shark, and here's a, a bonnet head shark that I got off a black tip uh, shark's stomach. And you can see how it was cut in different pieces. Oh, wow. So it could swallow. Next one. And here's a couple of sa a small sandbar sharks that I got from a six foot white shark. You can see how that white shark came from behind and beat them right at the color peduncle, you know, close to the color peduncle. And even though the shark had lost, when it got really close to its prey, it must have lost sight of it because the eyes are on the side of the head and the fish was right below the mouth. But with the ampullae luring scene in the electrical sense, it could sense exactly where that, where that fish was and was able to bite them with exquisite precision exactly where it wanted to and then swallow the rest of the body. Wow. We can look at cookie cutter sharks mm -hmm. that are the, you know, small sharks that eat chunks of fish, uh, eat chunks of flesh out of uh, other animals like whales, big sharks, sea lions. When we look at the jaw of a cookie, ch uh, next slide please. Uh, when we look at the, the the jaw of a cookie cutter shark, we see that incredibly sharp dentition that they use. Uh, I don't think that slide is following there. Did we skip some in there? The, uh, anyway. The next picture won't slide, so she's okay. going to jump one ahead. Um, anyway, the, these sharks can take chunks out of flesh, you know, they take plugs of. Uh, of fish such as uh, swordfish, sea lions, and so forth. They take it. I think it should have been called the ice cream scoop shark <laughs> or the watermelon baller because they, they just take a nice uh, round uh, plug. And I thought I had a slide of that there, but apparently not. But anyway, go to the next slide. But one of the things that made sharks so successful is their reproduction. They sharks give birth to life young usually, or in, in or lay eggs that produce young that hatch as fully developed sharks. They skip the larval stage that bony fish have, where the you know the, the egg is very small, it has no nutrients in it, what's a very small amount of nutrients. The animal hatches in a larval condition where it's at the mercy of you know biotic factors, current, uh, what have you, and very vulnerable to predators, and spends many months, you know, acquiring enough energy to to assume the, the normal the adult shape in sharks the the young come out as if as a miniature copy of the adult next slide a few sharks lay egg, e eggs and these eggs are, you know they're very similar to the uh, mermaid, mermaid purses that you find in the, in the beach which are actually skate eggs but that egg has all the nutrients that the fish needs the shark needs to develop and it there's no parental care in sharks. The, the females just lay the eggs and attach them to objects in the bottom. And then that little shark develops inside that case, usually for several months, a year or two, you know, with the only protection that it has is the, the horny egg case. Uh, and then when it's fully formed, then it, it'll hatch out. Next slide. Let's go to the next one. Some of them, like the nurse sharks, simply retain the eggs 
inside them and the embryo develops inside that egg case and you know you'll have embryos in different stages developing inside a female and when they're fully born they are released here you have an entire brood of nurse sharks you know some are still in the egg case at the bottom of this in the center in the uterus and then they are in different stages of development and as soon as they are fully developed they start releasing them a few every night uh, some, like the sand tiger sharks, have a very interesting method of nourishing, a mode of nourishing the embryos, which is egg eating. In these animals, the ovary is, is gigantic. It's, you know, in most, in most mammals, the ovary, you can hold it in the cup of your hand on a big, an, on a big mammal. Right. But in these sharks, the ovary may weigh 15 pounds because wow. it's, a, it's an egg factory. It's full of eggs in different stages. Uh, the embryos, by contrast, have a very little a yolk in, in, their, in their egg sac, in their, in their egg sacs, but they develop a precaution dentition very early on. And what happens is that the very small embryos, first, before they start eating eggs, the, the female is ovulating eggs that they use for feed, but before that, the, the largest embryo will go and kill all the smaller embryos. In that slide, you can see an embryo, it's there, it's pink, about uh, 10 or 12 centimeters, and to the, its left and below, you can see a couple of dead embryos. The, the younger, embry the largest embryo will go on a search and destroy mission in that uterus and locate all the annoying little brothers and <laughs> kill them. The ultimate answer to sibling rivalry, you just killed your annoying <laughs> little brothers. Next slide. Here's a slightly larger embryo, and you can see on the upper right, there's two dead embryos, the ghost-like uh, white embryos, where the other embryo is already like 30 centimeters and, uh, and so forth. Go, next slide. Here's a panoramic view of the uteri with two embryos, one embryo in each uterus that has survived and eaten all the other ones, and then it's got all of those egg cases that it's going to feed on for the rest of the time. And, you and these embryos acquire huge stomachs called... Uh, yolk stomach because they, they go through a period when the female is ovulating one egg after the other the embryos acquire these huge stomachs and next slide and this is about three quarters of development wow. and then the ovary has expent all its eggs and then the embryos just sit there and digest all of that food that they got in their stomach and when it's all absorbed you know they're born but they're born at about a meter so you can imagine the evolutionary advantages of being born at a meter in the estuaries Right. where there's lots of available prey, smaller fish, and very few things that can eat you. Oh, right. And this type of egg eating is also found in the thresher sharks. Here's two thresher sharks, one in each uterus. Next slide. And in this one, you can see the two embryos in the uterus, the, the, you know, the ovary over there, and one egg in transit and one already right. in, the, in the uterus that the embryo is going to consume next. Next slide. Uh, but in most of the advanced sharks, they are placental, they form a placental connection between the mother and the offspring and they're nourished just like a mammal or a human would nourish the offspring from the, blood of the, the bloodstream of the female. Next slide. You tell me when uh, uh, we need... Uh, what's that? One more minute. But anyway, in these sharks, they, had, uh, they start out eating the eggs, like uh, eating, you know, feeding off the egg. Next slide. And... Uh, next slide and they, they start to consume the energy in the egg case uh, very quickly when it, that gets absorbed they implant into the uterus and the, next slide and then the next slide and then the female would nourish them through that uh, that uh, umbilical connection hmm. and so next slide anyway just stay with this slide that you have now. You stay with that one. Then. Uh, this is one of the advantages, you know, is that they bypass that larval condition and they give birth to fairly large animals that are capable of taking care of themselves in the in the water very very quickly. Right. So they don't have that vulnerable stage like many fish do, right. or or even the turtles where they they're getting picked off by bigger. Exactly. So that all of those factors have made sharks the successful predators they are. They, they are the, uh, the, the supreme predators in the ocean today and they have been for many millions of years and they probably will continue unless we destroy them and as humans we have to learn to conserve them and protect them and so forth.
All right, well, I really appreciate you coming and talking to us today, and we look forward to seeing your new book and your new paper coming out soon. Thank you. And welcome back. During the break, I took a chance and, or took a second, sorry, to look at some of the questions we've got on our Twitter site. And so one of the questions is, why do you think the lionfish are named lionfish? Is it because of the stalking behaviors? That's a really interesting question. Um, when lionfish hunt, they do put out their pectoral fins to the mm -hmm. sides, and they do stalk, just like a lion would on the African safari. They kind of track their prey and sneak up and get closer. So, so maybe the, the pectoral fins to the sides would look a little bit like a lion's mane. Okay. If we look at the scientific name of the fish, uh, Taroas volatans, it doesn't have anything to do <laughs> with lionfish. It means uh, something akin to winged flyer. So, so how does so that translate to lionfish? It doesn't, it doesn't. <laughs> so the common name uh, is likely due to that either hunting behavior, stalking behavior, or the big pectoral fins that make it look a little like a lion's mane. At least that's my guess. Okay. All right, so the next question is from Christian Chu. He said, uh, why don't you just leave the dead lionfish out on the reef? Yeah, cer certainly. Well, Christian, that's something that we could do. I mean, there's nothing that says we have to bring these fish back out of the water but uh, they're awfully good eating. <laughs> <laughs> and just leaving that great eating lionfish down there for the crabs and, and fish to pick at um, is a shame. But the, the main message we want to get across is we really don't want people conditioning predators to associate humans with the free meal. Right. But if you, somebody speared a lionfish and they're not able to take it back up, leaving it on the bottom is certainly going to allow the crabs and other fish to come out and and pick at it and, and it'll be eaten. One caution is we certainly wouldn't want to do that in an area that has high tourism visitation like a, a popular dive site. Right. We don't want to see lionfish littering the bottom at a dive site or an area where the lionfish could wash up along shore because those spines even though they would lose their venom over time are still very sharp and you wouldn't want somebody accidentally stepping on one of those. But in deep water or some place that the uh, people aren't going, we can right. certainly leave lionfish out there. There's no real harm in that. Right, and, and they're not going to waste, as you said. They'll be eaten. They'll be eaten by something, yes. So, all right, well, during the break, you got a chance to set up some stuff. So what else did you bring me? Well, I brought a little present out here. Um, rather than talking about lionfish with pictures, ooh, it's still a little drippy here. Oh. Sorry about <laughs> that. I'll clean up after we're done. <laughs> but, but I brought a, um, I brought a little sample that we deep defrosted, this was in the deep freeze, to get everybody a look at the lionfish uh, spines and the anatomy. So if we look closely, we see the dorsal spines across the back, and these are all venomous spines when the fish is alive. Um, the venom is actually a protein-based neurotoxin, and it denatures with heat. Okay. So even leaving the fish out on the deck of a boat over time, the, the heat would slowly denature that venom and uh, the spines would lose their venom in a fairly short period, less than a day for sure. Freezing does the opposite. So freezing is, is preserving the venom. So a fish that's freshly caught, kept on ice and put in the freezer could still have venomous spines. And we'd have to be careful about that, like this. Right. So I'm not gonna let you so, touch this. Okay, spines. I won't touch this one. I don't, I don't wanna end, get stung. <laughs> we're not gonna end this mission with the lionfish thing, that's for sure. Um, so now I noticed that the spines are all along the dorsal, the pectoral fins, nothing else has the venom, just the dorsal spines? No, actually, let me, let we start with these because obviously they're the most prominent and visual right. of the spines. Um, but on the bottom of the fish, if I turn this fish over, we also have fins that are part of the pelvic, we have spines that are part of the pelvic fins. Oh, okay. So these two fins, there's a pair of fins called pelvic fins, the very leading edge on either pelvic fin is a venomous spine. Oh. So you have two here, one on each. And then back here at the bottom of the fish towards the towards the rear is the anal fin. And I don't know if you can see them, but they're three very small short oh, yeah. spines. And those also are venomous spines. So you have 13 dorsal spines, two pelvic, and three anal, so 18 total. Yeah, I wouldn't want to try and eat one of these. <laughs> no, if you're another fish, that's a lot to contend with. Yeah. Just to clear up, um, misinformation, the pectoral fins are the fins that stick out to the side of the fish. Let me see if I can get both of these to stick out and give people an idea of how big these are. 
and how the lionfish would put these pectoral fins out to the side. These are not venomous. Okay. They're all soft, thin rays instead of spines. And this may be where the lionfish gets its name. When it puts both of these fins out, it might look a bit like a lion's mane. So these are not venomous spines, and the tail is not venomous. Dorsal, pelvic, and anal fin is. And then we can also take a look. The, the head of the fish is very bony. It's mm -hmm. a member of the scorpion fish family, so it has bony cheeks. These aren't venomous spines. They're just bones on the sides of the head that you see sticking out okay. a little bit. That's the more bony the cheeks are. And then to give you an idea of the mouth on this fish, wow, you can see a lot bigger than I was expecting. Not yeah, really. <laughs> so when it's when it's feeding, it can just get close to a prey, and it, when it opens that mouth, it creates a lot of suction, and they just swallow their prey whole. They don't chop it up, they don't bite it in half. Just, it just goes down whole. Yeah, so it's a it's a beautiful fish, very interesting, but yeah, it doesn't belong here. And we're really concerned about these these problems that they're causing. Right. Well, um, How looks about if we like put this fish back? Yes, yes, please. Okay. We don't want any accidental things. So if somebody was out on the reef and they did get stung, or say I, I touched the spines, um, what would happen? What? Yeah, so, well, first of all, you'd have to get poked by the spine. Right. So the venom is in the spine itself. There's, mm -hmm. no, there's no venom gland at the base of the spine, like you'd imagine with the snake's fang. Okay. having a venom gland and a hollow port that that venom gets injected through. The venom in a lionfish spine is contained along grooves on either side of the spine. Let me pull our fish back up again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. No, no, it's a great question. Um, so, so if we look at the spine, you can see the skin covering. Right. That's what gives it the color. And during envenomation, as the spine goes in, the skin gets peeled back. You can see. Oh, and, and so. And the glandular venom tissue lies on either side of this spine. And it gets disrupted when the skin is peeled back. And that allows the venom out of that tissue and into the wound. Oh. But you'd have to get poked by that spine. Simply touching it is not right. gonna, is not gonna do anything. Symptoms of a, a lionfish sting are pain, immediate. There's no delay, it hurts yeah. as soon as it happens. And, um, and then most stings are isolated to pain and swelling at the sting site. So most people are stung when they're handling the fish. So um, swelling at that area, some pain. Occasionally, you could have symptoms that would radiate up an extremity, uh, numbness potentially. On very rare occasions, necrosis or tissue death under the sting site, so some blistering. Uh, but those are very rare, uh, along with systemic effects that would be very rare as well. Headache, nausea, other conditions, but it is a toxin, so you never know what kind of reaction you're going to have until you've been stung. Right, kind of like a bee sting. You don't know if you're going to be... That's exactly right. So we, we treat stings as potentially severe. Fortunately, first aid is also really simple. It's just immersion of the affected area in non-scalding hot water. Remember what we said about the... the denaturing the protein. Exactly, denaturing the venom by heat, so soaking in hot water helps denature that venom. Okay. And then after, say, a 30-minute soak, you'd want to go seek medical attention just to make sure everything is good. Good. Well, lad, we've talked to you about the predator and prey relationship of the lionfish, and we saw the video with the sharks. Um, so hopefully our students, um, <laughs> <laughs> let's see, the Charlotte Academy students, and the Port Charlotte Academy students, sorry, and Bowers Elementary, and the National Education Association. All of them are watching us. Hopefully they're gonna send us pictures of them playing tag here soon. Um, but what's the, what was the question or a statement that you had? You said, every lionfish counts, right? Yeah. So let's kind of talk about that. Yeah, I mean, we, we think about this issue in very broad scales, in broad terms. Lionfish are so widespread and they're so abundant and they're throughout all the, the Western Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico now, that sometimes we can kind of lose hope. It just seems overwhelming. Right. But it's important to remember that every fish, we, every lionfish that we take out of the water is having a positive effect on helping protect native, native prey. And um, we, I pulled up a little, little image here that we can show. We did a quiz. This is a, an image from one of our lionfish derbies where 1,043 lionfish were brought in 
and we did calculations based on the size of those fish and how much they would consume. And I thought it'd be fun to see what kind of answers people would have or guesses people would have if we had 1,043 lionfish brought in in a, in a single day event. How much prey would those fish have consumed over the next year if they had not been brought in? And I wonder if we get any, um, if we get any viewers posing a guess to that, to that question. We can certainly give it a few minutes and come back to that. Yeah. Awesome. But it's important to remember that control efforts to reduce the number of lionfish have a positive effect. Right. Even if it's only some of the fish that we're removing. We don't have to eradicate lionfish. In fact, we're not likely going to be able to. But every fish that we take out is helping reduce the pressure on, the, on our native right. species. And, and again, hopefully, you know, the students that I um, was talking about earlier, the ones that are watching this and they're doing my lesson plans and they're playing that predator-prey tag, hopefully they'll be able to see that. They'll be able to see that, you know, we can still have a, a healthy population of prey and predators and all be interlinked together. You don't have to have, you know, no predators or no prey, that kind of thing. Yeah, the, ba the balance in ocean systems is very interesting. It's very complicated. And when we know when we affect part of the system, it has indirect effects, direct sometimes, but also indirect effects on other parts. And, and when we have something like a lionfish, which isn't part of the natural system in this part of the world, it throws everything off balance. And that's why we're really addressing this, to go out and remove lionfish and helping to restore what would be a, a more natural balance to that system. Well, Bruce? No right. guesses. So everybody's worried about doing the math. I yeah, think. they are. Well, <laughs> well, actually, if we throw this slide up, we calculated that those 1,043 lionfish that were, that were removed in the derby would have eaten between 2 million and 8 million prey fish wow. in the next year if they had not been taken out. So that just gives you an idea of the kind of predation that lionfish are having and how every fish that we take out of the water helps protect the native marine life. Wow. Well, Lad, I'd like to thank you for coming in again. Um, sure have enjoyed it. Um, make sure you guys tune in next week. We're going to do art and conservation. Classroom Under the Sea is made possible through the generous support of Diversity in Aquatics, the project's official sponsor. To learn more, please visit diversityinaquatics.com. Classroom Under the Sea is presented by the Marine Resources Development Foundation on Key Largo in the Florida Keys and Roan State Community College, one of Tennessee's community colleges.